if you're joining us, uh, why don't you type something in the chat and let us know who you are. You know what would be a fun game at some point? To give people addresses and make them name the district. <laughs> that sounds like punishment. <laughs> I'm just looking at this map in the background. <laughs> yes, there, that there, it is amazing, and there are realtors who know. You know, there's a two block long street, and it is in this district, and they have them all memorized. Well, I it's like James Nunemacher knows every property he's ever sold, and I'll be like, oh yeah, I sold that. 20 years ago and it's this many square feet and we saw, and it's the memory is insane. Yeah. But that's, that's, that's atypical. I don't think most people have that sort of recall. Like I can remember all the properties I've sold, but I wouldn't remember the square footage. I wouldn't remember the bedroom bathroom. I wouldn't remember that sort of thing. Oh yeah, that is true. London. Hi Mary. Mary. Welcome. All right, we'll give people a few more minutes to join us. They don't have to walk between rooms, but. That's true. <laughs> oh, that's true, Dan. Welcome, Yelena. Well, we sort of seen you on um, the forms committee meetings. How could you forget? <laughs> what time do you have, Marsha? I have 2.57. All right, let's give it till 2.59, and then we'll, we'll start. All right. Looks so nice out today. I think I'm gonna go outside after this. It's a good idea. Like a civilized person. <laughs> I'm gonna listen to, listen to Mike Ferry as I drive to go pick up my wife. Oh, she's getting off work, but you don't get to you don't get to hear Mike Ferry uh, too often anymore. So I'm I'm looking forward to it. Well, now you guilted me into that, Neil. Now I'm like, yeah, I should go to. <laughs> you don't bring it on your smartphone. It'll be fine. There you Wait. go. All right, on my walk, I'll do that. Hi, Jan. Welcome. I think there is a Q&A section. Uh, I think everyone has access to it. So if you have any questions as we're going through this, um, we'd like to make this as interactive as possible. So feel free to type in questions. Uh, we'll do our best to answer them in real time. Um, we, we actually can't tell how many people are in attendance right now. Uh, so we're hoping to get some idea of that. Um, but right now we know at least that there are one, two three people in addition to Marsha and I. So that'll be good. And we do encourage questions because since it's a smaller group, that'd be fun for everybody, I think, to dig in a little more. We don't have to go through all of the, all of our predetermined points. I'm sure Dan will try and stump us. If Dan asks us any questions, I'm not answering them. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jenna, All right. there, there's 11 people. Could be more. The number doesn't automatically update. So awesome. Let's go ahead and get started. All right. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Happy Friday. Um, Indeed. Neil and I are here today to talk to you about the contingency removal form, my personal favorite form of all time. And I'll tell you why. Uh <laughs> Yes, that's nerdy, but it's true. 
uh, because it's like a cheat sheet to the contract. And whenever I send my clients a contract before we're writing one, hopefully before we're writing an offer, um, I send them a copy of this contingency removal and I say, read this one first because it's a list and it's super easy and it'll help you understand what types of things are covered in this contract. So with that in mind, we're going to go through general overview of the contract and talk about how those two things relate and how you can use it as a tool to not only understand the contract better, but also educate your clients in the process, both buyers and sellers. I generally find for buyers, it's more helpful um, just because they're thinking of which contingencies apply for them and what's going to matter the most for their offer and how to submit both the strongest offer, but one that protects them. So we will we advance this. All right. So there's some definitions that we just want to get out of the way. Uh, so first, the contract, uh, a signed agreement that is intended to be enforceable by law. And so in San Francisco, we are typically using the SFAR form, uh, San Francisco Purchase Agreement. Next slide. Uh, mm -hmm. And a contingency. So a contingency is a condition or an action that must be met in the contract uh, for it to become binding. And so examples, obviously, uh, applying for a loan or financing or a request that a seller make a specific repair. Ah, okay, so a contingency removal. So contingency removal, this is an important one. It's, it's a unilateral action, meaning that the party that is removing the contingency, uh, them simply saying they're satisfied, they're, they're satisfied about a condition or a contingency, um, they have in effect removed that item. It doesn't require the agreement of the other party. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, I do a lot of contract review and one of the most common problems that, that may come up is, somebody's in the process of negotiating and in that process, they deliver a signed contingency removal. And, you know, usually people they, they've lucked out and people kept negotiating in good faith that, that it was fine. But in truth, they've, they've used their, they've lost their leverage. They've removed that contingency. So you want to be mindful of that. Next slide. Yeah, just, and I'm going to throw in one comment on this point. You know, in our market, we often see contingencies removed initially when you submit an offer, some contingencies, maybe not all contingencies. Um, so it's not something that necessarily has to happen in escrow. We're often determining what type of offer is best, um, you know, with our clients, talking them through what works for them and deciding, OK, can you remove a number of these contingencies out of the gate to deliver a strong offer without putting yourself at risk? Um, in terms of, you know, like Neil was saying, finance contingency appraisal, depending on their situation. Uh, and so another important concept to keep in mind, um, in the absence of any written removal of contingency, all of the contingencies are active, meaning they're all in place. And in our contract, and I believe also in the CAR contracts as a rule, uh, we, we have what is known as an active removal of contingency requirement, meaning that until the party that's removing their contingency has done so in writing and, de and delivered it to the other party, the contingency is still in play. So uh, just to be clear about what I'm talking about, if you have a 15-day inspection contingency and on day 16, they have not, the buyer has not removed their inspection contingency, that contingency is still in, in play. And of course, the, the contract has a process by which the seller can serve a notice to a buyer uh, in order to encourage them along the process of removing that contingency uh, called a notice to perform. But uh, there, it doesn't happen automatically. And this would be as opposed to a passive contingency removal, which again, we, we only have active contingencies. We do not have any passive re removal of contingencies. A passive removal is sometimes seen in some commercial contracts like the AIR contract. And in that, when the date elapses, and the contingency goes away. So uh, keep this in mind in SFAR's purchase agreement and in CAR's purchase agreement, you always require a written contingency removal to have evidence that the condition is satisfied. And it looks like we have a couple questions. So I'm going to start with these now as we're going. This is great. Um, let me see. So Dan I asks a bunch of questions. Dan, yes. And I wasn't <laughs> sure. If, I was looking at the chat and now it looks like they're in both places. Thank you, Dan. Let's keep in the Q&A. 
Uh, can you verbally remove a contingency? Do I have to use the form? The answer is no, you cannot verbally remove it. You do not have to use the specific contingency removal form. It could be written into a part of the contract, additional terms, and an amendment, or, well, more likely an addendum um, delivered to the other side, but it does have to be in writing. Yeah, contingency removals have to be in writing. His next question is, does signing the title report remove the contingency? I assume that's the contingency for title review. Uh, and I would say, no, uh, that does not remove the contingency uh, for review of title. That is simply an acknowledgement that they've received a copy at best. Because we have active method of removal, there is no such thing as being out of contract. Yes. Uh, so the, you will not automatically fall out of contract, which is a question that comes up quite a bit, simply because a contingency hasn't been removed. And just because the agent on the other side says we're out of contract, uh, because you didn't remove a contingency does not make it so. I'll just say to that point, be mindful. If you receive a notice to perform, it, you could receive it in advance of the expiration of your removal date. So, you know, you may get a couple extra days. You may not. Just be aware of that with your clients when you're educating them about how the contract works. Excellent. Okay. Let's go on to the next slide. Ah, and so... What happens if you get to the end of a deal and you close escrow and there's still contingencies that were never removed? What does that mean? Well, fortunately, if the deal closes and there were still contingencies in effect, the fact that both parties agreed to close the transaction, disperse the funds, re record the deed means that you have a waiver of those contingencies. That does. I just want to make a little caveat to that, which is even though you have a waiver at the end of a deal, it does not extinguish statutory rights. So for example, the right of rescission under the transfer disclosure statement, if the party that was supposed to receive a complete TDS, i.e. the buyer, uh, did not receive it. So there, there is no waiver for statutory rights, but you can uh, have waiver for any remaining open contingencies. Okay. And looks like we have another Q&A. Uh, nope. I think we got them all. Go on. All right, and here is the contingency removal form. And it looks like a long checklist, which is very convenient for us. And you see all, uh, and I'm sorry, my pointer is a little nuts. Uh, here, I'm going to try to do this locally on mine. Um, you can see we're moving down all of these contingencies. We'll go through some things to consider with each of them. And then um, also some language in the contract itself that references and contextualizes each of these. And so, so to, to be clear, okay. this is the roadmap, right? This is the roadmap of the contract. This is the, the whole point of this presentation. You have a single page reference that you can produce for your buyer client or even your seller client that lays out uh, most of the contingencies that exist in the contract or can be created. And I, I'm going to make this caveat now. We can come back to it later when we're talking about the, con the actual contract um, and offer form. But there are often people will confuse mandated disclosures with contingencies and those are actually separated in a contract. And when you see where they fall in the contract, it's, it's meant to be clear that those are not contingencies. Um, but be aware, like the underground storage tank is one of them, different things that people think, Oh, that's another contingency. It's really not a contingency in this contract from a, in that same way, it is a requirement, much like water and energy conservation. Good point. All right. All right. So we're going to pick apart the contingency removal form just very quickly. First thing is just a, a practitioner warning. Do not use the contingency removal form in order to renegotiate the terms of a deal that you've put together. Um, there are, there really isn't a place for it in the form. Um, but if you check a box and say, I'm removing my inspection contingency and down below you're saying in the uh, exceptions area or in other, seller agrees to credit, buyer, blah, 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 dollars. Um, this is not the place to do that. It may not be effective. I, in fact, I would argue it's not effective. Uh, so don't use this form to do that. And remember, don't remove the contingency until you've sorted all the terms that you want to have captured in exchange for removal of a contingency. Next slide. 
All right. Now, um, interestingly, if we were to look at the contract right now, the section that discusses contingencies and contingency removal is a one or two sentence uh, section that doesn't necessarily explain the implications of removing a contingency. But here at the top of this form, which is why we always suggest you review this form with not just only your buyer clients, but also your seller clients, it actually lays out what is the impact of removing a contingency. So I want to dwell on this for just a second. Uh, And the first thing is I'm going to read, I'm basically going to read it out loud, but I'm going to emphasize certain parts. So by checking a box below, the boxes are the specific contingencies that are referenced in the form that the buyer is indicating, and notice this is only the buyer, the buyer is indicating that they've had an opportunity to inspect and received contractually mandated documents, parenthetically, or waived the right to receive them. So let's pause there for a second. If you deliver a contingency removal for all with your offer and the seller has not provided certain other contractual disclosures, you have waived your right to receive them. So what are examples of contractually obligated disclosures that somebody would probably want to receive and wouldn't want to accidentally waive receipt of? Well, the San Francisco seller disclosure is a pretty big one. And um, if you remove the contingency for that item with your offer, but the seller didn't include it in their disclosure package, they don't have to provide it to you. So just keep that in mind. Really important. It goes on to say, that um, the buyer should not sign off on this until they've received copies of those those documents and they're agreeing to return them, obviously. Um, And B, they're fully satisfied with the the items that are the subject of the conditions, i.e. physical condition of the property, et cetera. Really, really important that you understand the impact of removing a contingency. And here's a perfect place to to explain to your clients why they might not want to remove a contingency. And I, I have a personal opinion on this, which is, As a licensed professional, as a licensed person, I never recommend to my client, you should remove this contingency, you should remove that contingency. I always frame it as, are you satisfied with the understanding that you're going to assume some amount of risk if you remove this contingency? If you're ready to do that, you can instruct me to prepare this form. And and Neil, perhaps this would be a good time to talk about what that risk might look like broadly. Mm -hmm. So we're, I don't think we're planning on going into that a ton, but if you've removed all of your contingencies and you have liquidated damages signed by both parties, mm-hmm. um, that is the amount of money on the line. So 3% of the purchase price, not a small sum of money in our market generally. Um, and so if a client understands that, that's going to help inform these decisions because otherwise, you know, this ambiguous con the idea of, Oh, well, I'll breach contract. What does that even mean? Well, it yeah. means seventy-two thousand dollars, <laughs> yeah, or fifty thousand dollars, potentially, or whatever. Right? Yeah. Exactly. So that's that's a big deal, and of course, anytime somebody's contemplating uh, backing out of a deal once they've removed all their contingencies, the advice that that I always offer, and I encourage you to offer, is you know, Mister Miss Client, you probably should speak with an attorney who's knowledgeable about our purchase form, so that they can explain the potential risk that you're facing here, because you may not automatically just get your money back. On the other mm-hmm. hand, if you're exercising good faith, a contingency that's contained in the contract, then you have a reasonable expectation to recover the initial deposit you've put in. Shall we go on to the next slide? Yes, I'm going to make one other point before we do that, which is when you're going through disclosures on a property and they're, the seller has provided a, a whole bunch of stuff, as we know, often in our market, going through IO or wherever they're posted, good idea to take this form and hold it up next to the checklist on those disclosures and say, oh, what do we have? Check, check, check. And that's a, it's a, just a good cross check for you to know as an agent, hey, are we missing something, something important? Agreed. All right, so next piece is the list of all of the individual contingencies that are enumerated in the contract. Not all of them are on by default, but all of them are found in the contract and can be turned on in the process of writing an offer. Obviously, a conversation to be had uh, with each uh, each one with your client to determine if it's an appropriate fit for the offer they want to put in, or if you're discussing the contract form with your seller client, the sorts of things that might potentially be an issue with a buyer making an offer. All right. And the last thing is, there's a nice little box underneath the uh, contingencies 
that is exceptions. So you can remove your physical inspection contingency, 12A, except for and carve out specifically that you want to have a roof inspection done. Or you could remove your uh, financing contingency except for, and it might be a uh, verification of gift funds. Whatever is appropriate to your purchase agreement, you could also remove all except financing and appraisal. And the, the value of using the all, which we'll, we'll touch on again, is it's, it's a clear uh, communication with your client, the buyer, typically. Uh, at this point, once you've removed all, this is the time when you have to understand that if you don't close the transaction, your deposit may be at risk. That's right. All right. Pressing along. All right. We'll start with the financing provision. This one has been coming up more and more. Oh, one one other point to that exception, the all with exceptions. Um, you know, so often we're sitting with our clients trying to figure out how to write a stronger offer in a competitive situation. And, it, you know, of course, it's much easier to write an inspection contingency straight without any specifics around it because um, it's speedier. But the reality is the more honed in you can make your offer, often the more competitive it's going to be in that landscape. So um, just a reminder to people that that's a way to to make your offer a little bit more competitive to against something else, maybe who just had a broad inspection contingency. All right, financing. We're seeing this pop up more and more because lender guidelines are changing because of all kinds of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, so you've presumably spoken with your client about a lender they plan to use. Maybe you've gotten a pre -appro they've gotten a pre-approval letter. Maybe they've started going through the underwriting process. So the conversation around this is, where are we at in that process? What type of protection do you want in this offer regarding the approval of that loan? And it's this is a very, very specific thing for every client. And it's a discussion that they're going to also potentially want to have directly with their lender you don't necessarily want to facilitate that conversation and be the go-between. Good point. Uh, and, and one other point about the financing provision here, we can read through it. Great idea to put an interest rate in the blank space that it provides um, because otherwise you're essentially leaving it open to any interest rate, which is not, necessarily what your clients want. They might be able to get a loan at 6% interest, but they may not want to take that loan. Marsha, can you do me a favor? Uh, I can see that there's a the financing provision from the contingency removals floating on top of this. Would you just right click on the, the larger part and send to front on the, the slide that's open? Uh-huh. Or if you right click there and send to back, see if that'll work. Oh, oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Um, I don't think I can in the presenter mode. Oh, Let's... okay. Never mind. Let's. Um, yeah, we might just have to roll with it. We'll roll with um, it. So, to your point, so one C is the area where you would specify the, the loan terms. I apologize. Um, I have a picture floating on top of it that was unintentional. I. Uh, but you could also have contingencies under other financing. So, if there's seller provided financing, um, obviously, if you check the box in one uh, C for FHA or VA financing, there's some contingencies that come with that. Um, there could be um, some other financing contingencies, like it might be a personal loan from a family member. Maybe you want to include some conditions for that. Uh, obviously, you also have the ability to go with non-contingent financing. That is, in our, in our parlance in the San Francisco Purchase Agreement, that you're not making the obtaining of the loan a condition of the purchase of the property. All right. And we'll go to the next slide. The next slide. So um, paragraph three of our purchase agreement actually has the time period where this can, the, the financing provisions, the finding financing provision that lives in section one is specified. So 21 days by default, it goes on to have a few other little disclaimers. Definitely worth reading. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna focus on it because I wanna be sensitive to time. Um, but for instance, when you're dealing with credits, credits from the seller or credits from an agent, uh, there may be limits. It's important to understand what those limits are because the buyer may not be able to take full advantage of those credits. And just a second point to this paragraph, um, 
21 days or X days. Um, again, perhaps thinking about, is this going to be a stronger offer if we can get further along in the loan process a little bit more quickly as an agent, not a bad idea to have that conversation with your client. Hey, the, this might be more attractive to the seller if we wrote it as a 10 or 15 day, if that works for your client. And Dan is adding a comment. Thank you. Under exceptions, you could put a subject to seller's execution of the attach amendment of additional terms dated blah, blah, blah. Uh, I guess that would be a way of ensuring that, that the contingency removal is tied to an addendum and it's only removed once they have agreement. So thank you for sharing that, Dan. I appreciate it. All right. Appraisal. Appraisal contingency. So this is a, a short uh, and it, it is only in effect if checked. So keep that in mind as you're preparing an offer. Um, if you want to have an appraisal contingency, check the box. And a nice feature of our purchase agreement it, is it allows you to fill in a price other than the purchase price to be the the minimum appraised amount. Uh, so if if this was an instance where a buyer wanted to make their offer a little bit stronger, they were offering a million dollars, but uh, they thought that might be more than it would appraise for, they could say as long as the property appraises for $950,000, we will move forward with the purchase. Uh, check the box, fill in the 950. So it can be a number other than the purchase price. And that, of course, is giving an assurance to the seller. Uh, I, this is a serious buyer. They're willing to pay over what they think the property might be worth, and they'll make up the difference. All right. Okay, title review. This one, you know, it's interesting. A lot of first-time buyers have no idea what a prelim is. And they have no idea what this is. I come across that a lot. And they say, I don't know what this thing is. And you say, well, let's talk about it. And it's incredibly important, as we know, as agents. Um, and so you want to make sure everybody has a copy of the prelim, that you're clicking on the links. If the links don't work, you get a new copy from the title, from title company. Even if you're looking at disclosures, that happened to me the other day. Um, and I just, it was not a problem, you know, just got on the phone with the escrow officer, said, hey, can you send me a fresh copy with active links? And there was a, you know, a deed restriction that we needed to understand, my client needed to understand. And so if you're the listing agent, remember to create those links and PDF them, put them at the back of the report, super important, um, and help your client understand that this is critical to, to really thoroughly understanding the property they're buying and what they can do with it. Um, Anything else on that, Neil? Uh, I think you hit a lot of the good points. Um, obviously, this is an opportunity to point out, have a conversation with your buyer client. W are there some use issues for you in the future that might be affected by matters affecting title? So is there an easement across the property that would prevent the, the buyer from uh, expanding the footprint of the home or doing something with the home that they'd like to be able to do? Or is there a deed restriction that might somehow make the property less valuable to them? Uh, so maybe they can only park in the communal parking space two out of seven days of the week. And maybe they have to have a place for their car on a regular basis. And this is a perfect time to have that back and forth conversation with your buyer so you can further understand what's important to them. And just on the listing side of this also to share some th some recent things that have come up for me, just, you know, make sure you always want to read the title report when it, your prelim immediately when it comes back on a listing that you open pre escrow. So, you know, if there's anything that maybe needs to be cleaned up, that could be cleaned up on the prelim. Um, and Great often point. title companies will be really proactive and say, oh, yeah, you go talk. They talk to the seller. You figure, why is that on there? That's not legitimate anymore. And then they take care of it, remove it. And then you can put a much cleaner copy in your disclosure. So something to think about also. And that you saying that triggered something else for me. Um, if your buyer is getting a loan on the property and there are noti uh, notices of violation or abstracts of judgment that might affect the ability to even get a loan. So just keep that in mind. When you look through the title report, um, you, you may find something in there that makes it harder to get a loan or to get the financing that you need. Just another reason to have your financing provision. All right. Next. Least or leaned items. All right, Neil, you want to take this one? So this is not talking about if you've leased a car, obviously, uh, but there may be uh, services provided to a home or things that are physically installed at the home, solar panels, um, in some instances, uh, washers and dryers. 
uh, or other equipment uh, like security systems that come with a lease and buying out that lease or terminating the lease may have significant penalties. And it's important that uh, the seller provide information to a buyer so they can decide whether or not they want to um, accept responsibility for the solar system lease or they want to accept responsibility uh, to have this vendor provide laundry services in the building. Um, And so a contingency specifically for this, uh, this is something that's oftentimes overlooked uh, by a seller who who doesn't think about it because maybe they're actually getting revenue from it. Uh, They don't think of it as a lease per se or an obligation that's tied to the property. All right. Property inspections. This is a fun one. (laughs) So this includes a whole lot of things. Um, you know, generally when we talk inspections, we think about physical inspections, mm-hmm. um, but it also includes, you know, thinking about your due diligence in general, thinking about all of these other things that could impact a property. Um, I'm, I'm just looking at the language here, like square footage and things like that. Um, so you might receive some information about that in the disclosures and have that conversation with your seller, you know, or your buyer rather, we see a lot of things like gross square footage, people are measuring in walls, people, you know, tax records show one thing, want to make sure that your client understands there may be three or four footages out there, and that they just need to be comfortable with that. And it doesn't change the reality of the property, but that, you know, the perception could be changed based on those, those numbers being advertised one way or the other. Um, and certainly with inspections, we also see a lot of proactive inspections on in disclosure packages. Mm-hmm. So when you're representing a buyer and you, you're helping them understand the disclosures and you've got some inspections, maybe you have a general inspection, you have a pest inspection, they're reading through those, asking questions. Always a great idea to have them call the inspector if they have questions instead of you trying to figure them out. Um, that's also just a liability thing that would be a good idea. Oh, Marsha, you, you're a good risk manager. I like it. Well, it turns out I, I get a lot of weird construction questions, and I have to honestly say to people, I really don't know, but I want you to talk to somebody who does know. <laughs> That's a great answer. Uh, uh, Dan, Dan also points out in the question answers that uh, in the CAR contract, they call uh, the equivalent due diligence uh, process uh, an investigation as opposed to an inspection, because a, a lot of people think the word inspection specifically means having an inspector come and do a thing, look at the property. And, and really, this section applies to all of your due diligence activities. Uh, Dan also points out one of my favorite parts about this. So the, the 12A inspection contingency, the, the buyer's due diligence, um, this is the sledgehammer in the buyer's toolbox as far as being able to uh, get out of a contract. Because as Dan points out, uh, the the standard for exercising this contingency is at buyer's sole discretion. And sole discretion can literally mean, you know what? I don't like avocado formica countertops. And that's why I'm backing out of this deal, which seems capricious, but sole discretion is just that, that powerful. It allows them to back out. It is also the reason why sellers don't like the inspection contingency or for the buyer to have it. And again, an opportunity to craft maybe something that's a little bit more specific Maybe the buyer, you had a conversation with the buyer, they're satisfied with the, the, the pest inspection and the contractor's inspection, but they want to have come, somebody come back uh, to measure specifically for whether or not the, uh, the, the um, sofa bed that they want to fit in will fit through the door. You can, you can narrow down your, conting- your contingency around these issues, uh, but they still live under property inspections. The other thing is, uh, and this is very salient right now, um, the ability to obtain insurance lives in this paragraph. It's it's not in the financing provisions. It's not part of the appraisal contingency. It lives in this. And obviously, if you are dealing with properties that might be uh, damaged in fire or flood, um, the ability to obtain insurance is a critically important component and can make the expense of buying a home much, much higher. So really important to understand, this is where a lot of the tools in the toolbox live. And this is a really big tool for a buyer client. All right, pressing along. Oh, good. And then the opportunity to waive that inspection. <laughs> yeah. So, so this is one of the, there are a number of mechanisms in our contract that allow you to write out these contingencies um, without 
removing them. For example, non-contingent financing might is another example of that, right? So in this case, you might be signing that, or the, the client might be signing that they waive the inspection contingency. Um, and that takes care of that removal for that one item. That said, always a good idea, in my opinion, to have your contingency removal form clear. Um, you know, if you're removing a handful of contingencies and you intend to remove your ins property inspection contingency, you know, including that there. Agreed. Agreed. I, I, it is frustrating to receive an offer where they've indicated that they're, they're removing their contingency on the contingency removal form, but they didn't initial this section or vice versa. So um, I, as a listing agent, I would not be afraid to ask the buyer's agent, hey, can you just clarify, have your clients clarify, I want to have this crystal clear so I can explain it to my seller so they have the option to accept your offer without having to counter you on some of the stuff. All right, that's right. And that's where it's just helpful to think of these two forms in tandem with one another. Condominium disclosures. So this covers a whole lot of stuff. Um, CCNRs, bylaws, any of those condo financial disclosures. Um, you know, if your client's purchasing a condominium or, or a co-op, which is going to have different documentation, you want to make sure you're getting good documents there. And you may also want them to talk to the lender. You might want to call the lender about some of these things. Um, some, you know, some very broad examples would be what's the owner occupied rate? Mm -hmm. How many, you know, on that financial disclosure that you get, there's a lot of information about the profile of the development. And a lender may say to you, well, I don't, we're not going to lend on this property because one owner owns 90% of it. That's a high risk yep. for us. Um, go ahead, Neil. No, I agree. Uh, and down below, just I'll point out, if you are dealing with a cooperative apartment, which is a, another form of subdivision um, where you own shares in the company, you own the, 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 the company that owns the building, you own shares of the company, and then you get a lease to your unit typically, uh, you can check the box down below. Um, there are, I don't know, maybe 30, 30 to 40 buildings like that in all of San Francisco. But for people that deal in those areas, that addendum brings additional contingencies. So um, that is a place that uh, by incorporation, you're pulling additional contingencies into your offer or your contract. And one other note on the this paragraph 13, when you're looking at the provided disclosures under this category, there is also a form, an SFAR form that you might see that says what's available, what's not available. Yep. And, you know, if it's a small HOA with two or three units, they might ha not have bylaws, they might not have a reserve study, they might not have these other documents, but for a big development, much more likely that they'll actually be following the rules and doing these things. Um, so just really going through what you think is expected from a particular type of development and understanding that and having your client understand that and making sure that the lender is on board as you're writing that offer. I agree. And just to sort of echo that, um, people sometimes ask me, oh, you know, I'm not an expert in condominiums. I don't understand the documents uh, or I don't understand what this means. Uh, and, and as just like with the inspection contingency, what Marsha was talking about, you don't, you're not expected to be an expert on these documents. But what you are expected to do is look through them, make sure they've given you all the things they've said they've given you, that all the pages are there. And if questions come up that you don't know the answer to, don't make up the answers. You refer them to an expert that's going to understand that. And so that might be referring them to the property management company or the HOA management company. It might be referring them to an attorney that's familiar with this sort of subdivision. It may be referring them to an accountant who can look over the budget analysis and reserve study. Um, it might be referring it to a contractor to look at some of the work that might be coming up that, that is anticipated as repairs that have to be done because that may result in a special assessment, i.e. a bigger uh, bill in the near future. Yep. That's all, all good points, Neil. Ah, rental property. So um, I apologize. It is one of our biggest paragraphs. It is very dense. Um, there are all sorts of contractual obligations that live in the contract when you're dealing with a tenant occupied property that a seller selling. Uh, there is of course, um, 
the fact that you want to disclose that there that it is tenant occupied, that you're going to try and get a tenant estoppel, you're going to try and find out in San Francisco whether they might the tenants may claim to be protected for some reason. You have obligate the seller has obligations and the buyer has obligations when they close to disclose rights to uh, to a to the tenants uh, once by the seller and once by the buyer. Um, and Dan, thank you for pointing that out. Is it is a sole discretion standard, uh, meaning that again the buyer can cancel the contract if there's something that they that they learn in reviewing the disclosures that are provided under this paragraph uh, that they don't like, they can back out of the deal. Thank you for sharing. Um, there are several forms that sort of correlate to the uh, paragraph 14 obligations. Uh, obviously, the the tenant estoppel. Um, there is also, um, and now of course I'm blanking on the form, but uh, the um, answers the nine questions. Marsha, feel free to, to tell me if you can think of it. I, of course, I'm blanking. It is probably, the, uh, something questionnaire. There is, yeah. Dan might know. He's Dan, a, Dan will probably pipe in. He'll probably uh, pipe in. Yeah. Um, to, to this point, I just want to make a topical note on this right now. If you have a client looking at an investment property that, currently has tenants, they plan to place tenants into. Um, really important for them to understand what's going on with COVID, what's going on with eviction protection, what's going on with the moratorium. All of these laws that really just were not in existence pre-COVID. So there are new things in the mix and they're changing and there's new legal precedent and all these, these moving parts that certainly none of us is qualified to answer. And so if somebody's going to place a tenant, if they're existing tenants, really smart to have them talk to a, a landlord attorney who yeah. understands these rules and, and chat about what they plan to do and what risks might be assumed by adopt, you know, taking on these existing tenants in the property. And so the form I was trying to think of is the seller's rental property statement that specifically answers those nine questions. Um, that are listed in the paragraph right now. Um, again, just to echo Marsha's point, w unless you are a qualified San Francisco tenant landlord attorney who practices this on a regular basis, and you're probably not buying or selling real estate on behalf of clients, then um, be extremely cautious about providing guidance here. Um, the, the Really the only applicable guidance I can offer, echoing Marsha's point, is to consult with a qualified San Francisco tenant landlord attorney well, and, and I think when you're having that conversation with your client, the reality is, yes, it's cost a little bit of money to talk to an attorney, but the consequences in San Francisco for not understanding and having to deal with a tenant in a way that's unexpected is significant. You're, they're talking about significant sums of money. So if they're going to complain about a couple thousand dollars, you need to make sure they understand that really what they're looking at could be hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not properly handled. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Income and expense statement is sort of a follow on when you're dealing with investment property. Um, the, the, the buyer has the right if checked to request that the seller deliver copy uh, copies of the financial statements for operating the rental business. Um, the default is the current year, and then you can list additional calendar years um, in, the, in the space that's provided. And I will just say that sometimes this creates confusion with first time buyers. Um, this is relates to an investment property. So like if you're looking at a single family home and they're saying, where's the income and expense statement? Mm -hmm. uh, not generally applicable unless it's a, it's rented out. And there, there's lots of sellers who don't actually have a professional bookkeeper or aren't working with a professional property manager, and they may not have any of these available which of course, if they've checked the box, the buyer will have the opportunity to review that information, whatever they've provided and decide if they want to move forward or not. Um, but the, the, the paragraph is there so that you can check and request that you get an accurate portrayal of rents and operating expenses to operate that rental business. All right. This is a fun one. We might see the return of this a little bit. <laughs> um, this is the sale of buyer's property. So in many other markets, not San Francisco too much recently, but people will write offers contingent on the sale of their home that they're currently living in. So they have a place 
to move and they can seamlessly sort of move from one to the next without taking a bridge loan or moving into interim housing of some kind. Um, this also has a specialized addendum that goes through a bunch of details that you will be filling out if you use it. Mm -hmm. um, talks about this your buyer's timeline to sell their property. It talks about a lot of different aspects of, is it in contract, is it not in contract? It, you know, all of the, the escrow timelines that are anticipated. So the seller of the this new property can evaluate that and say, okay, do I, am I willing to take on the chance that this transaction may or may not close and what is the likelihood based on the information they've provided? Here, here. You know what I love about this? This class uh, probably wouldn't have existed in San Francisco three years ago because there were no contingencies. We wouldn't even talk about using a contingency removal except for the all button. And now we get to be reminded of all the good parts of the contract that are there and the different rights that people have coming into negotiating in their deals. I love it. Uh, okay, so next we're on to paragraph 19. So for those of you that uh, are familiar with the contract, work with it on a regular basis, uh, there's this paragraph and then it's followed by a bunch of really important documents um, so this is my opportunity, first of all, to point out that there is a difference between contractually mandated and statutory disclosure requirements. So the transfer disclosure statement, the natural hazard disclosure, the 3R report are all examples of things that are required under statute, under, under laws, either at the state level or at the local level. Same thing with the lead disclosure, if it's, if it's of the right age. On the other hand, there are certain things that are listed in the contract that are designed to help a seller make a thorough disclosure about the property or what they know about the property, like the San Francisco seller disclosure, that are not required under the law, but are part of the contract. And so going back to that idea of the contingency removal, if this form hasn't been delivered to you, so for example, since the San Francisco seller disclosure hasn't been delivered to you, and the buyers removed all their contingencies, they don't have to receive that. The seller does not have to give it to them. So be aware of that when you're removing contingencies, that it's okay to be selective. It's okay to say, I'm removing all except seller still has to give me the San Francisco seller disclosure, and that will continue to be an existing contingency. Well, let's go ahead and go ahead to the next slide. Yeah. And just a practical note mm -hmm. uh, from a transactional perspective, not all contingencies necessarily apply to mm -hmm. a property like we were talking about. So like if it's not a rental property, some of those things might not apply. Ultimately, the other the seller side is probably going to ask you for an all removal at the end, towards the end of a transaction. If for some reason, if they're if they're doing their paperwork really well, they might. But and some agents don't like to give a, a, an all remove, and that's okay. They advise their clients not to do it. Um, let's go ahead. Go to the next slide. Yep. So um, the transfer disclosure statement, as I said, is a statutory disclosure. You can tell because they, they reference a civil code section here. Um, this is also the paragraph that defines what a complete TDS is, a transfer disclosure statement uh, in San Francisco under our purchase agreement. And so that is all of section two is completed. That's the section that has all the questions and the seller signs and dates. And section three, which is where the seller's agent indicates what they're going to do about their AVID. Are they going to complete one? Are they not going to provide anything or is it attached? Um, so again, this is where the transfer disclosure segment that is being defined as being complete. And of course, this is obviously one of the very important disclosures that happen. A, tra a transfer disclosure statement isn't required in every transaction though, because sometimes you have exempt sellers. Some of my favorite clients are dead people. And so they don't have to complete them. And I love that about them. All right. San Francisco seller disclosure. So this was just retooled recently mm -hmm. um, and it was broken up into a couple of sections. Hopefully it makes it a little more user friendly. I know none of us like to have forms changed on us, so it'll take maybe it'll take a few months to get into the flow. But um, broken out into different sections, depending on what type of property it is. So if you've got a multi unit, if you've got an investment property, um, those sections, you've got a, the initial section that is generally applies to everything. And then you've got subsections depending on the specifics of the property. And it has a lot of good information, it asks a lot of questions that are super specific mm -hmm. for San Francisco. So important to have, important to talk through the answers on this. If your clients have questions, 
not a bad idea to have them read Gibbs, which mm. goes through a lot of the points that this touches on. What's uh, Gibbs? <laughs> General information providers and sellers. It's now called Disclosure um, and Disclaimer Advisory. There you go. <laughs> Wait. Yeah, it's one of my favorite forms too. Um, and it's it's not a short document. It's about twenty two pages, I think, but it's broken up into easily digestible paragraphs about a lot of these different topics. And so it's super helpful for someone who's unfamiliar with San Francisco. Agreed. Uh, and just so we're clear, uh, some practitioners out there, uh, sellers, sellers agents who are representing probate estates or exempt sellers who are trusts will sometimes include an addendum in their disclosure package that actually counters out the requirement that the seller provide a San Francisco seller disclosure. And I'll say they can do that. Um, you know, we, we think that the forum is valuable in helping guide people to provide answers to questions that, that they might not otherwise think of. So hopefully they've presented it to their seller client and had them review it. Uh, but it, it is a term that can be countered out uh, using an addendum uh, in the contract. Next up, we have the natural hazard disclosure statement. This is an example of another statutory disclosure. It has the, what is it, six questions about whether or not you're in a high fire zone, a earth, earth liquefaction zone, very often people are providing substituted reports like a JCP or a disclosure source, source uh, as examples, third-party vendors who are providing these. Um, that is one fine way to satisfy this requirement. Um, and again, just a note on disclosure review, since we're kind of all over the map, but all these things are together. They work together. Um, if you see something on this, natural hazards disclosure that that is a little bit outside the norm. That's for sure your client should be calling the insurance company. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's for you as an agent should trigger like, oh, want to make sure if it's in a high risk fire area or flood zone or any of these other things. Um, incidentally, this past year we had, or maybe last year we had um, a lot of the major companies add that 100-year flood zone mm -hmm. distinction for San Francisco. So you will see that on many of these reports. Um, these are all just things to consider as it relates to insurance, as well as your client's comfort level. Here, here. So this is the questionnaire that lives inside of the Earthquake Hazards booklet. Everyone, I hope, knows that, uh, I believe it was July of this year, they updated the booklet, they updated the, the form that's in the back of the booklet. The, some of the questions have been changed. Uh, it does not change the fact that uh, the questionnaire doesn't have to be answered for properties built after 1960. Uh, so you'll only see a completed one or it's only required uh, if the building was built prior to 19, 1960 or earlier. Uh, but uh, this is another contingency. All right, lead-based paint hazard disclosure. So. This one is pretty straightforward. Well, it's a standard form that people will fill out. Oftentimes you'll see it look kind of blank because people will say, yeah, I don't, I don't have any knowledge of lead-based paint. Mm -hmm. um, ideally, you might write no in there, but I don't know. I'm not going to start giving legal advice. <laughs> That's a good call. <laughs> you know, Dan will probably yell at me in the chat here. Um, so, yeah, just want to make sure you've got it and your clients are comfortable and that they understand that there is a chance, even though they may not have disclosed anything about it, that an older property might have some lead paint existing that could be agitated or something like that if they were to do construction. Yeah. And it, it's only required on buildings built prior to well, the middle of 1978 and earlier. Permit history, AKA the three R report. Um, the report of residential building record in San Francisco. Uh, this is the uh, permit history uh, that's issued by the Department of Building Inspection in San Francisco. Everyone knows it as uh, a report that is in almost every uh, one to, residential one to four disclosure package. It talks about whether or not uh, their energy and water compliance has been done. It now also says whether or not you're in a hundred year flood area. Um, in addition to that, it'll show all of the building permits, not necessarily electrical and plumbing, keep that in mind, uh, that were pulled on the property and their status as far as the city's records go. Um, they are somewhat notorious for not being 100% accurate, so keep that in mind. Um, other useful information that's in there is also zoning and the current authorized use of the property. Uh, so just a, a very good uh, disclosure. Um, 
It is not a substitute for the buyer going and investigating at the building department to look at other permits or other things at the planning department that might affect their future use of the property, but it is a very useful starting point. And and to that point, um, if your client is interested in doing their own further investigation, there are some online tools that SFDBI has that allows you to drill into some of this information. If they want to take a look at those and read further, that can be helpful. Um, Agreed. There's one other point I was going to make on the three R. I don't remember, but I'll come. It'll come to me, and then I'll make it later. And the catch-all other disclosures that the um, the the seller has an obligation to provide the buyer with documents in the seller's possession that are needed to complete the seller's disclosure obligation. Things like th- th- that might include old disclosure information, old inspection reports, architectural plans, signed-off job cards, permits et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is a nice catch-all and a nice reminder that it you don't just provide the first items. You, the seller should really do an inventory of things that they have in their possession or things they're actually aware of that might affect the desirability of the property to a prospective buyer. Additional terms, paragraph 49. This is the place where everyone tries to squeeze in way too much information in three lines. Uh, This is also the place where people will say, see attached addendum or see attached blah, blah, blah document. Um, And in this one, I I happen to have a clause in here that is not a contingency, uh, but a, a nice reminder that in the San Francisco purchase agreement, if the buyer absolutely wants to have liquidated damages and arbitration, I'm not gonna dig into that too much, um, they need to include a clause that says it's going to be incorporated into the contract. Uh, The way that our contract is set up right now, they can initial those two paragraphs. The seller cannot initial them, choose not to initial them and simply create an acceptance. And they're in contract without the benefit of those two paragraphs. So if it's important to your buyer client, you want to add this additional language, which is different than in the CAR purchase agreement, where it actually clearly specifies you need to have agreement on these. Otherwise you don't have a formed contract. Okay. And addenda. All of the various, and this is not all of, uh, but this is many of the addenda that might also have contingencies incorporated into them. So assumed financing addendum, short sale addendum, seller financing addendum, cooperative apartment purchase addendum, tenancy in common addendum, purchase addendum, assumed finance. I'm reading. I hate when people do that on a PowerPoint. Um, There are literally forms for everything. And there's, of course, blank addenda in which people can craft their own uh, contingencies, make it a condition of the sale that, for instance, um, the seller also provide the keys to their 1967 Ford Mustang. Uh, And if they're not willing to do that, buyer can back out. You can make it a condition of the sale. So um, remember that although we have a roadmap that shows us how to get from an offer to a closed deal, there's lots of little pit stops along the way where you might have to, to go aside and think about how it affects your buyers and your buyer's needs. Well, Neil, to that point, we've talked a lot about buyer contingencies. Mm-hmm. We have not spent much time talking about seller contingencies. We're not going to go into that today, but mind, you know, be mindful that seller contingencies exist also. Um, and do. there are a number of instances where that might be advantageous for your client. And to think through, particularly if you're representing, um, you know, representing a seller and something's important to them to understand that that can be negotiated. Everything can be negotiated. Everything that's legal is negotiable. Um, And of course, there are instances where a seller may have a contingency. So the seller's intent to exchange, uh, they might might have a provision that allows them to back out of the deal. Now, I will point out that our contingency removal, the form that exists in our San Francisco library that we started at the top of the of the presentation with uh, is only signed by the buyers. Uh, there's an acknowledgement space for the sellers, but it's not used for removing seller contingencies. Uh, and so, but it, the contract still specifies that if the seller has a contingency, it those contingencies need to be removed in writing if they're going to be effectively removed. All right, we kind of co- we covered all earlier, but we did cover all. Yeah. Okay. All right. Oh my gosh, we're perfect timing. And maybe we'll hop to some questions before we do this conclusion. Mm-hmm. All right, Gabriella. There's no specification on the SFAR contract that states who pays for what. Should we always specify that in 49? There actually is a paragraph that includes who pays for what. It is paragraph, 
11, I believe. Um, and so there, they, it, as opposed to the CAR purchase agreement where you check boxes to specify who pays for what, uh, most of it is encapsulated in what's traditional in San Francisco. But if you want somebody, if you want to include a provision that is more specific or different than what's pre-printed in the contract, you would absolutely use paragraph 49 or attach an addendum specifying that, for instance, the buyer will pay transfer tax, which is not the common practice in San Francisco. Great question. Any other questions before we finish up? I'm going to check the chat just in case we have anything in there. We're getting kudos from Mark and Nina. Thank you so much. It's very kind of you. Yeah, that's so nice. So uh, in conclusion, I, and I'm sure Marsha will echo this, uh, strongly recommend that you join a committee. You might consider the forms committee uh, because it will help you guide your clients much more effectively and help you build important professional relationships and, frankly, make good friends. I agree. All right. I think that's it, folks. Well, sorry we didn't get to see you. I'm glad everyone got to see us. I miss everyone's faces. And hopefully hopefully soon we will. it will be safe for us all to be in a room together again. Agreed. I'm looking forward to it. Bye, guys. All right, everyone. Take care. <laughs>